Good evening and thank you so much for turning out in your hundreds to come out the city. It's amazing that something to tell her of the East End, isn't it? A quick introduction, my name's Norman Curtin. Um, I'm a member of the Antiquaire Society in Sunderland. And Tony asked me to put together a little talk, roughly about the East End. But the problem is we're talking about the East End, it's not just geography. You can't just talk about buildings because the East End is more than commerce and industry. The East End is really built on its people and they were incredible people over the years. The hardship they went through, when you think about the 20s and the 30s, what they went through, 40% unemployment, to come through it all, absolutely incredible people. But I'm going to talk about the people, I'm going to talk about the places, I'm going to talk about the murders and the prostitutes. If you recognise anybody, just keep quiet. <laughs> We're going to do 25 minutes, and then we're going to have a break, many minutes I'm incontinent, but I think Tony wants to sell a few drinks the bar. <laughs> when we talk about Sunderland, a little bit of history, uh, Sunderland was, the, I suppose, the main place in this area. Forget about Bishop Weymouth, Monk Weymouth, Sunderland Parish was tiny, but it was actually the main parish in this area. It was absolutely packed from the 1500s, 1600s, absolutely packed with people. And it was known as Sunderland by the Sea. It was a, a tiny little parish, and the, the, the big people, the Lord, 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 Lord Lanton, had summer houses in High Street. This house here was uh, rented by Lord Lanton about 100 yards from where we are now. So it wasn't a run down area forever, it was a, a really incredible place to live. This is a copy of Rainside Plan, which just shows you in 1790. And it's difficult to see from the back there. Well, this is the high street, you've got the butcher's market in the middle and every Friday from 10 o'clock in the morning you'd get hundreds and hundreds of people coming along for the market. The market would open at midnight, lit by tallow lamps so you could buy anything you want from oysters to crockery. It must have been an incredible thing. Something we should really have, think about having in the East End to get a big street market. I think it would be absolutely wonderful. Well, this is how the East End would have looked. This is a place called Hatkiss. Down High Street to on the right hand side, a triangle of land, absolutely rife with disease by the, by the 1790s to the 1820s, 1830s. Cholera here was rife, but you can see just how tightly packed these dwellings were. The left is, is a place called South Alley, and that's looking through the Silver Street. On the right is another part of that case drawn by an artist called Moore. And this is a pub which many of you might remember being East End, is the Waterman's Tavern. It was probably the last one in the hard case to, to, to survive. When you think what this guys this area went through in the 1830s, cholera came. And I don't know if you know, but cholera was really spread by the poor people from the poor house because the ambulance then used to be a sedan chair. And what they should have done after every case came up, they should have cleansed the sedan chair. But they used to this go around the east end having races, and of course it infected everybody, and hence cholera spread very, very quickly. This is a place called Fitness Row. Again, long gone, but fit, the, the fitness, the coal fitness, were really the, the, the most powerful people in the industry in between the coal owners and the people who actually bought coal and spread it throughout the country. And they had their own street called Fitness Row. But this is about, eight, about 1880, and you see the tiles outside of each door. That's human excrement. Because they had, they, they had no toilets. And this is, it's called night soil. So they used to do the business on the night time and then in the morning put it in piles. And if you had a really good job called a scavenger, your job was to come around and clear all the human poo and take it. I don't know if you know, but when they were building Hendon, there was very little water for the builders to use. So they used to use the water from the, the ponds, the puddles. But the scavengers from Bishop Weymouth used to empty all the human excrement into the ponds down in Hendon. So houses like Tower Street were actually built using human excrement as part of the cement. I think the smell's long gone, so if you live in Tower Street, find some your way. If you just have a close up on that picture, and you'll see the uniform of the northeast of Sunderland, you know, the girls with those white pennies, and you probably couldn't get those pennies as white now with all your biological washing powders. Even the girls have the, the flat hats on, and the reason these girls have got the bairns holding the bairns is because the parents are probably working, so the eldest girl would nearly always get the children to look after. This is the East End in the 1930s, just before the big demolition started and the Garths were built. But well, you can see just how tightly packed it was. 
And many of these, had a lot of squalor in the East End, sadly, but many of these were tenements. And in one house, you might have 12 families. So you can imagine the strain on the infrastructure in the area. But one of the wonderful things about the East End was the carnival they used to have every year. A massive carnival. I think people were too embarrassed now to get dressed up. I mean, I don't mind getting dressed up as a woman. There's a couple of fellas there dressed as women. <laughs> but I think people are a bit too inhibited now to do things like this. I know the carnival carried on recently was mainly jazz bands and a few floats. The East End Carnival in those days was, was, it was enormous. This is the East End Ragtime Jazz Band. Now if you have a look at this picture, it looks like at least 50% of black African. I don't know where these people came from, or if it is just the sort of politically incorrect boot and black, you know, the, the boot polish. But this one must be a hell of a thing to see. That guy in the bottom left, he's got the end on his trumpet. <laughs> it's, an, it's an incredible picture. I, I'd love to have heard these people actually playing around the streets. And there's another one, the 1930s. Everybody's dressed up. Uh, men dressed as women there as well. I don't know whether these early transvestites are just a thing you actually did. They're obviously having a good time. I love this photograph, the next one. I don't know what that guy in the right stone wore his trousers, but he's making room for something. Oops. <laughs> Anybody can tell me where he's wearing them trousers? Because I didn't know. You reckon? But, but that's, what, that's how they used to get enjoyment once a year, the massive carnival, round the streets, a good drink, good time, very little crime, very little problem, and that's the way life should really be. If you had no money, no matter what the celebration, you would still do something. This is the coronation of the king and queen, and everybody is getting involved. Just a bit of bunting round your house, get dressed up and come out. And again, this is what the East End was all about, this kind of social life. This to me is one of the best pictures ever of the East End. It's absolutely beautiful. It uh, shows a mother and daughter, probably just below here, just below the Boar's Head, looking up the river. And the tall ship's obviously coming back very, very soon. And let's hope we can recreate that river kind of scene. This is one of the earliest photographs of the East End. It's taken from Thompson Shipyard across the river there. And looking over the top of Thompson, we're actually building a wooden ship still. The top picture is from the sea up until around about pottery buildings. The bottom picture takes it from pottery buildings right across to the old Elizabethan Custom Quay. And you can see just how dense an area that was. This is the Long Bank, again just below where we are now. And I think in many other places in the country, this kind of thing would have been kept. When you think of Whitby, when you think of some of the little the fishing ports, yes, we needed the port, we needed the docks, and unfortunately it had to go in the 1930s, but they could have been incredibly, um, well, historic houses kept. This is the top of the Long Bank, um, and you see some girls playing skipsy looks, they've got no shoes on their feet. This is the top end. Uh, this is the way people used to live. This is halfway down the long bank, and you'll notice the woman at the back there, she's carrying her shopping on her head. They <coughs> used to have something called a wheeze, uh, they used to carry the baskets on the head, they used to have a, a twist of, of material which would cushion the baskets to stop them from falling over. And it was said that Sunderland women, East End women, were incredibly straight of back, and that's probably why the nose used to carry when they were walking about. But the bands playing down the bottom, you, you can't let your bands out of the house now, but in those times, there was very little worry about your children being abducted and taken away. That was perfectly normal for the East End. And this is the reality of life in the East End. This is the back of Long Bank. And there's three, well, there's two kids there and a lady, which is the, the communal tap. Twelve houses to one tap. And at the end of it, there's one netty. That must have been a hell of a strong spell of netty, I tell you. <laughs> This is just uh, to the seaside of where we are now, and this is a place called the Stone Yard. And this led through a little alleyway, uh, again hundreds of people living in this area, but you can see one family outside of the houses. And the thing I love about this is the hard haircut. The lad at the top right had what was known as the hard haircut. If you would kick hard, 
You'd shave your head, but you'd leave it tufted hair at the front. <laughs> and that meant you were a good scrapper. <laughs> well, that picture's about 1890, and those haircuts lasted about 1910. The, the last place to use them was Monk Weymouth. So Monk Weymouth had the hard scrapper's haircuts after, after the East End died out. And this is one of the pictures that really got me interested in local history as a kid. This is one of Weirbull's photographs, and you can see the Customs House key at the key on the left, the old mission rooms at the top, and you can see just how dilapidated it is. I mean, health and safety would have an absolute fit these days, but you've got where people are actually walking, it's just, it's just collapsed at the bottom there. The building to the left, the old fashioned one, the stone, is actually the Elizabethan Custom House, and that has been there since the 1500s. Unfortunately, no photographs have been signed, but I imagine it must have been an incredible place to visit. And that's where the famous Peggy Potts was incarcerated. You have probably heard of Peggy Potts? She lived down on the quayside just below here. And her big thing was to, to basically um, get a uh, rum whiskey from the, the sailors and sell it without paying our dues. And the customs men were permanently trying to capture her. And there's a famous story told where they actually capture her and she starts dancing. And the custom man says, what the hell are you doing, Mrs? So I'm just, I need to go to the toilet. So you let her go behind the wall and she emptied all the stuff out and she peed inside the, the barrel. And the, the pee went back in the barrel to the customs house. So when the custom man opened up, the taste he got wasn't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it tasted much different. Now, this to me epitomises the East End. These are the fish lives. And this picture's probably in the 1930s. And it shows three of our very, very popular fish wires on the quayside. side. These women must have worked incredibly hard, you know. <coughs> what incredibly hard lives they had. And the work when they were 60, 70, there was no retirement, there was no dual system then. You had to work, otherwise you'd be without. And this is how the high street looked just a bit further up. This photograph's about 1925, 1926. And you can see just how busy the high street was. You've got the Eagle building on the left. Next to it, you've got the little pub that was dismantled and taken to America, the Half Moon Inn. You've then got the, the Exchange Buildings, which are then the Siemens Mission. You've got the British Empire, and then Bottlewell Lane, leading you down towards the river, and then you drop down past Bottlewell Lane and come to where we are now. Teeming with life. This is a part of the high street which is roughly just over the road to where, where we are now, looking back up towards the town. The building on the, in the middle, the huge building, is the old market, which is really the centre of East End life. We don't have a good photograph of the old market, but I'm busy working on a reconstruction now of the whole high street, and this is what the market would have looked like. From the early 1890s, 1900s, if you went in there, the first thing you'd see is a great big roundabout, and that was a halfpenny ride for the bands. The roundabout was then used down in Roga, on the sea front for the big carnivals, then brought back to the East End to put back in the market. But when you went through there, this is what you saw inside. Initially it was, it was the Butcher's Market, it was, it was the Delft Market, different, all, all different markets. But then it was just amalgamated into one. This is about the 1930s. And what they're selling, second-hand furniture, second-hand clothes. These are the hungry 30s. These are people who can't afford new clothes, new, new, new furniture. So they're down there getting people's cast-offs. And that's really what kept these East End folk alive during that rough time. This is the butcher's stall on the market. This is probably about 1890. It's a photograph that we've done it on our Facebook page. Absolutely wonderful picture, but there are about 30 or 40 of these at the butcher's markets within the butcher's market itself. And I bet those kids never did were out for a lot of years. And I bet the dog didn't do were out either. <laughs> this is the back of the market. This is about 1895, and you can see the, the cannon on the left-hand side sunk with the stem. And this is the back of the old market, and that led you out onto Coronation Street. And when you came out to Coronation Street, this is what you saw. You know, the Market Hotel, the butchers was just to the left-hand side. To the right-hand side of the market is the exit place for the, mar for the, for the market itself. You went down Coronation Street, and you probably remember Armbruster's hairdressers on the left-hand side. And then you turned down to Church Street. And the, the second building you came to was called the Dead House. And it's where anybody who died in the East End was taken uh, and they were examined before the post-mortem before they were taken away by the undertakers. And we're going to visit the dead house shortly. <coughs> the big problem with the East End was that by the time the 30s came, 
things had to change. The buildings were dilapidated, uh, really in sandy conditions, and people were ready for a change. But what it changed into, in some ways, was really good. This is just before the changes. Uh, one of my colleagues gave me this photograph. This is washed in the barracks. Uh, and I love the colour of them pennies. <laughs> I love the colour. That, that's white question in the background, I think, as well. But well, this is the barracks. And look at the shoes. They've all got uh, clogs on. They've all got wooden clogs on with metal toe cuffs. Well, this is how women used to dress in the East End at that, that period of time. An absolutely incredible family photograph. And I call David Shooks the thorns in. And he's got a whole family collection. To have a camera in those days must have been really unusual. And to actually still have those photographs now. What an incredible thing to have in your family history. This is the back of one of the houses at the East End. And it just shows you what people did to make a living. You've got a father and his two sons there. And then you've got a cobbler's business. You've got to do something. You've got to make money somehow. If you fall out of work, there's nothing to fall back on. There's no parish relief, there's no dole, there's no benefit system. You've got to work, otherwise you do without. This is probably one of my favourite areas. This is um, Blue Anchor Yard, right on the quayside. This is about 1895, 96, and there's a dog leg there, and it leads to a pub called the Duke of Wellington. And in the dog leg, there was a, a lass called Scotch Kate, who was one of the local prostitutes. And she always used to take her clients to what was called the dog leg. She was known as dog leg Kate. And we'll, we'll meet her again later on when we talk about the ladies of the night. I, th I did a book of the old prostitutes with us called Sharon Vincent. And we thought we'd put a, a, an index at the back. And the first thing people looked at was the index to see if the family name was in there. <laughs> this is the East End. Uh, this is Coronation Street. And it's probably about the 1920s, carnival time. And you can see the bands are just dressing up wherever they can. They can't afford fancy dress outfits. They're just making things out of paper and having a really good time. And look how the street's heaving. This place teemed with life. That's now then, if you're going to get drunk down the East End, don't go to the Wharf Tavern. <coughs> this is the walk you've got from outside the Wharf Tavern to Blackpool Embry. And the reason there was a there was a dead house on on in, 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 on Bull Lane, there was a, a dead house on Bull Lane just around the corner here, and most of the people who were out in, in the dead house were pulled out the river because they'd fallen in legless. Mostly sailors, a lot of children as well because the children thought they were invincible if they tied an eel skin around their ankle. That was a local tradition amongst local kids. An eel skin meant you were protected from the river's demons. But there's more kids fished out the river. God love them and take the, the, the dead house to God love you. This is Aris Lane, Aris's Lane, on the side of High Street. And what you're looking at there, the arch at the bottom leads you through the High Street, and just to the side of the exchange buildings. Now, the pub at the back is called the Old Bull and Dog, the one on the right is the Newcastle Arms. And in the 1790s, a man called Jonathan Coates lived on the house on the left-hand side. And he was an informant for the press gang, and people hated the press gang. And when the press gang sort of left Sunderland, he was left at the mercy of everybody. And there's one night he's in his house, and the dog gets hammered in. And the men come upstairs, and they throw him out of the window. And he was lying outside of his house, and nobody dared touch him in case they were associated with the press gang. But the woman that, that, that licensed him, the old bull and dog, got a bit sick of the smell because he was there about two or three days. And so he, she got some soldiers from the local banks to come and take him away and bury him in the churchyard. Nobody else would dare touch the body. So that's Aris's Lane. And further up was where the tatters used to have the stables, if you remember that from the East End. This is uh, one of the most famous buildings in Sunderland, would you believe? This is where Jack Crawford was born on Pottery Bank. And this is the other side of it. it must have been an incredible thing to see in the Times. Uh, but this was pulled down 60, 70 years ago, uh, along with much, much of the East End. And thank God we've still got some photographs to look back on. If we didn't, a lot of the East End would be lost, especially the old East End. <coughs> this is uh, Bottlewell Lane, where the ferry was. The last ferry, 957, the Hapney Ferry. People in Mount Weymouth used to get it for free most of the time. Uh, but we had to pay for it half a Hapney to get it Weymouth. Two pubs there. And on the right-hand side was where Tommy Sanderson used to have his shop. And he put a clock out there. 
And we're talking about the 1820s, 1830s, when he got sick of playing with Hockle, and if you know the, the, the verb to Hockle? <laughs> People used to Hockle on his clock, and he got it. <laughs> Compilations to the longest hockle before it's. All of a sudden, I'm only, I'm only telling the story later. <laughs> he shot, packed up, and went away. The big problem Tommy Sanders now for his beer is that he didn't use to water it down, so he made a profit. <laughs> this is Northumberland Street. This is Lizzie Valenti, one of the ice cream sellers. Uh, a lot of Italian families live in the East End of Sunderland. When you think of all the names, Valenti, Giddy, lots of them. And this is Lizzie Valenti going around the sun like the ice creams to the Burns. In the 1930s, they realised we're going to have to get rid of all these, these houses because they're just dilapidated and we need a new start for the East End. So they decided they're going to get rid of everything and, and, and start afresh. Thank God they kept a little bit of the East End. This is what they've kept. This is a few minutes of film from a man called Jack Casey. <coughs> Jack Casey, a local boxer, and he had a video camera, a city camera. This is film he took at the East End in the 1930s. There's Jack Casey there, very, very well known family. Now, the Casey's had a house in Church Walk, and they had money. But if, when you went to bed in the night time, you'd shut your curtains, but the Casey's left the windows open so you could see what they had. <laughs> This is Minoga. Now Jack's got his bear out there. This is young John, and he's teaching the box. And that bear became a really good fighter, more, more of a street fighter than a, than a boxer. You can see the colours. And what you've got there is a place called Minoga Close, which is just up beside Church Walk. And that's where the family, just right around the corner from where they lived. But Jack Casey did a lot of filming up there. And it's unique footage because if you look at fo uh, footage from the East End or, or from the 1930s, it's generally kings and queens and, and posh people. That's not the kind of stuff we want. This is what we want. Real people. You can't keep, you can't keep them back. <laughs> you must have had those boxing gloves specially made, God love them. Well, there's some real East End characters here. So do you recognise any of the places that we go through? That's the bottom end of uh, Coronation Street. That's Freddie Parrotface Davis. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember him? <laughs> this is the christening. Uh, it's the Casey family christening. This is the back of Trafalgar Square. And again, it's unique footage, not just for the places, but for the people as well. And that's the new baby, the family group. They're all dressed up for the christening. And he's the daft lad. I don't know where he's getting the bed's bike from. I'm not sure where there is in the background, but they never work it out. But look at the hardship on her face. Look how the life in her face. This is the 1930s, women still wearing shawls. I bet she's seen some life, God love her. And there's a young lass, she must be only early 20s. She's got the shawl on. I mean, the character in his face as well, it's absolutely wonderful. So you notice that the washing on the lines, strung across the road. That's the local midwife on the left-hand side there. Now he doesn't want his picture taken. But Jack Casey's got to make sure he gets his picture taken. <laughs> <laughs> and she's wondering what the hell's done now. <laughs> These are men on the door, just sitting outside the houses, nothing, nothing to do. And look at the state of him. <coughs> God love him. This is church work, which now lives down the Doniston School. On the left hand side, you've got the, the uh, workhouse. 
He's got his jump sandwich. Look, he's jumped your step. He's bloody monkey. I mean, this is so special because all he's done is just set his camera up in church walk. And he's just waiting for people to walk backwards and forwards, which is unique. And that bear's still hitting every bugger. <laughs> Get the buggy. Crossbow. Crossy. Crossy. Remember the three wheeler bikes? If you had money, you got one with the basket on the back, didn't you? She looks like a hard woman, doesn't she? That's what you call feisty. This is again working up, working up from like Trafalgar Square. Really characterful people, full of, full of fun, full of laughter. Yeah. <coughs> the men coming from the pits. In a couple of years' time, they'll be fighting a war and probably dead. If you look at her Gansey, her top, it's full of holes, bless her. Full of holes. But she's happy. And you notice the clogs? Uh -huh. She's one of the, the ropey girls. This is the Hendon ropey. And there's one of the young soldiers. They've just come back from Hendon Baths. They've got the rolled up towels in hand. Go on, go on, look at them. Nice middle partner, real cream. Go get that in I think they're putting a the sky satellite dish up the top of their head. <laughs> There's the disc on no. <laughs> Julie Sky. Look at the character in that woman's face. <coughs> I mean, she's wonderful. That's the proggy man. <laughs> That's when you all hit on a Friday night, remember? <coughs> That's the high street. You're looking down towards the boar's head now. This is Church Street on your right. And in a minute, you're going to see the local undertaker. There he is. That fog never leaves his gov all the time he's there. He's got, he's got a tooth in his head. He's a way to catch your body now. I don't know about you, but I think this is incredible footage. It's so rare to have footage like this. He's the three musketeers. <laughs> There's a bit of bullying going on there. I didn't know if you remember Borgies. You used to nick your sister's pram, didn't you? <laughs> now, this, this is little John Casey. And he's got a new bike. He doesn't know how to work it, bless him. And he's just got to push it. He gets that fed up. Put King Eye on the top of the picture. Just King Eye on the top of the picture. And once the straight dog gets out of the way, I'll guarantee you've never seen a bogey like this one. And he's going to lose interest in his bike very shortly. He's the bogey. <laughs> This is dropping down towards the docks, and you'll see the hot pie man. There's the hot pie man. There's the polis. But he was plenty busy doing that. And that leads us on to Burley Garth. And Burley Garth was pulled down and we had the real Garths. And this must have been incredible housing. If you can imagine being in a tenement all your life 
And then suddenly you've got two bedrooms, you've got a kitchen, you've got a toilet, you haven't got to worry about other people here and what you're doing in the toilet. It must have been incredible. Your little shop on the corner, everything you want, this must have been incredible housing. And there's Mrs. Duncan from Wee Garth, one of the collection of photographs we have, that's the twins. And that's a silver cross pram, if you remember them. <laughs> that's Sheila and Brenda Duncan on top of the Garths. And this is a lady called Sarah Cameron. It's a photograph that we shared in the Facebook page. Her husband died at sea. He was lost when we had really heavy storms. He was lost at sea. And she spent the rest of her life just sitting at the top of our flat in the Garths, looking over to the sea, just reminiscing about life when I went by. People lived in the Garths. People were schooled around that area. Remember Jimmy Willies? Yeah. Jimmy Willies stood at the top there. The pub on the right was the Royal Standard, and on the left was the White Lion. And right in the middle was St. Pat's School. I bet any of you went to St. Pat's, the Catholic school. I did this talk to some old folks down in Hendon, and one of the last said that she went to St. Patrick's School, and she remembers a little boy there about 1910, and in the winter, he was absolutely freezing cold, he had no shoes on his feet, he used to run to school. And when he got there, he used to take his dad's cap and put his feet in to keep them warm. The nuns used to key at the bottom of his feet if he was late. <laughs> so for the children. That's St John's Church, long gone. St Patrick's Church itself. And this is church folk leading up to Holy Trinity. And here we are back where we started, this is where we are now. And I'm going to talk about some murders, but it's half an hour now, so if you want a quick break, five minutes, and I'll see you when you get back. That's right. <laughs>